Thank you so much, and a very warm welcome to you, and it's a real privilege and an honor to be speaking to you today. We are looking at Luke's Gospel, and we're in chapter 21, verses 12 to 19. And this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, encouraging them about what they can expect to come. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison. And you will be brought before kings and governors and all on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you the words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends. And they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. But not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. I want to speak to you tonight about how to face opposition. We all face opposition. It's practically impossible to go through life without facing some kind of challenge or difficult circumstance or opposition in our lives. The only way to avoid opposition is to say nothing, to do nothing, and be nothing. But if you want your life to count, if you want your life to make a difference, you can expect opposition. It comes with the territory. And so often opposition comes when we're not expecting it. So often we can feel so out of control. A lady owned uh, an expensive and exotic parrot. And one day she decided to clean out the cage of her parrot. So she got her vacuum cleaner. She took out the hose from the vacuum cleaner, turned it on. She opened the cage of the parrot, uh, the parrot's cage, opened the door of the cage. She put the hose inside. And as she put the hose inside, she heard the phone ring. She turned her head. And as she turned to get the phone, she heard this noise. Stop. She looked back, she realized with horror that she had sucked the expensive, extravagant, exotic parrot into her vacuum cleaner. So she switched it off, she opened up the bag, she took out the parrot, she ran it under the cold tap to try and clean it down, got her hair dryer out and started blow drying her parrot. She put it back in the cage on its perch, closed the door. Can you imagine that scenario from the perspective of the parrot? <laughs> Just a few moments ago, you were sitting on your perch, minding your own business. The next moment you've been sucked up, washed out and blown over. Life can sometimes feel like that, can't it? I know that I've had times like that in my life. Over several years, often my reoccurring struggle, battle, opposition has been with health anxiety. About two years ago, for the very first time, I experienced what I guess I would describe as a, as a panic attack. And I just thought, whoa, where has that come from? How am I going to cope with this? And when those things happen in our life, I think it's so tempting to think that we're the only one facing opposition. We can begin to look at other people and compare. We think, oh, if only I had their life. They've got it all together. Everything seems to be going well for them. But just take a look around the people you're sitting next to. Whatever people might look like on the outside, you can pretty much guarantee that they are fighting a hard battle. They're facing opposition of some kind. 
We can put on a good front. It's a bit like when you go running. It's a bit hard to tell, but I occasionally like to go running. And I have to confess, when I'm running, normally everything hurts. My joints feel like they're hurting. I'm huffing and puffing, and I'm kind of just making my way around the route. But when I see a runner coming the other way, I normally find this little extra bit of energy and a spring in my step and a smile on my face and I start running a little bit faster. I'm not hurting. I'm like cracking it today. They go around the corner. I start having a cardiac arrest. So often we want to present the best of ourselves to other people. Or perhaps when you're going through opposition, you might be tempted to think that you're doing something wrong. Chances are you're doing something right. The enemy would love to throw you off course. Jesus himself faced opposition in his life, physically, spiritually, emotionally. I find it fascinating that Jesus says, love your enemies. There was never a question that we would have enemies. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. He says, take heart, for I have overcome the world. So what can we learn from these words of Jesus in this passage? How do we face opposition when it comes. As with any challenge, we have a choice to make. How will we respond? And I think the first choice that we make is to choose to turn your opposition into your opportunity. Jesus says in verse 12, they will persecute you on account of my name, but this will result in your being witnesses to them. I don't know about you, but whenever I'm facing opposition, often the last thing I'm thinking about is finding the positive opportunity in that opposition. But so often God uses our opposition as an opportunity. He can turn our battles into blessings, either by doing a work in us or a work in those around us. About 18 months ago, one of my sons decided to come and do Alpha here at HTB in the evening. And he was one of the youngest on the course. He was 15 years old. And at the end of the course, he was so excited and passionate about wanting to tell his friends about Jesus. So he went back to school. He had a couple of conversations with people and he just thought, what I would really love to do is start Alpha in my school. So he prayed about it. We prayed about it it with him as a family and he decided to write to one of his head teachers so he wrote to his teacher and he thought God's really going to come through he got the response back no you can't do alpha in your school so he was a little bit disappointed he started getting a bit of hassle from his friends uh, at school who thought he was a little bit strange for wanting to do that with his faith so he kind of left it and then a few months later he thought I don't know, maybe I'll have another go. Maybe this time I could start a Christian union. So he spoke to his philosophy teacher and said, I'm thinking about starting a Christian union. What do you think? And he said, well, I've been praying for someone to start a Christian union in the school. So they had a conversation. They wrote to the head teacher again. The response came back, yes, we would love you to start a Christian union in the school. So the first 10 weeks of the Christian Union, (laughs) he decided to run Alpha. 40% of his lower sixth form year have done Alpha. Teachers have been coming along. They're still coming along to that. You know, that opposition initially was turned into an opportunity. And in reality, opposition comes in so many different forms. It has many different faces. 
some tests are inconvenient or uncomfortable. Some tests are even life-threatening. And in a room like this, I suspect there are so many different versions of opposition that we're facing. Maybe even some facing prison or persecution for their faith, represented from all these different nations that we've heard from. But in 2019 in in London, often it can be a little bit more subtle than that. It can be easier to keep our faith secret or private. What does it feel like to tell our mates at work on Monday morning that we've been in church or to speak out and stand up with integrity for something at work or to not be ashamed of our faith? Whatever you are facing in this passage, Jesus promises that he will give us wisdom and words. Even if you don't know what to say, even if you don't know what to do, he will give you wisdom and words. So choose to turn your opposition into opportunities. Second thing, choose to turn your fear into faith. Jesus knows that we're going to face challenges. But his promise is that not one hair on our heads will perish. When we face opposition, it's so easy to respond with fear. And I think that's completely understandable. We are hardwired when we're faced with an imminent threat to respond out of fear. We can either fight or flight. The adrenaline gets pumping. But both of those reactions are a response to fear. And perfect love casts out fear. So how do we respond to opposition in a way that doesn't respond out of fear? Jesus gives us another way He says in this passage, stand firm. Don't fight. Don't flee. Trust. Stay faithful. Stay full of faith. And when we do this, it says we will win life. I love the story in the Old Testament of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's an amazing, amazing story. It's one of my favorites ever since I was a child. How the wicked King Nebuchadnezzar brought the three men before him and he said, I want you to bow down and worship the idol that I have made. And if you don't bow down, I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace. If that was me, my adrenaline would have been pumping at that point. I would have been fighting or I would have been fleeing. But these three guys, they stand firm. They choose faith and not fear. This is their response. We do not need to defend ourselves if we are thrown into the blazing furnace. The God we serve is able to save us from it and he will rescue us. But even if he does not, Know this, O king, we will not serve your gods or bow down to you. They didn't know the outcome, but they chose to stand firm. They trusted. They didn't waver. They didn't deviate. They didn't get swayed or compromise. They said, know this, O king, we are not bowing down to you and your ways. And I want to encourage us tonight. We need to be people of faith, not fear. People who won't compromise. Maybe you're here today and you're in some way feeling tempted to compromise. Maybe in your workplace, in your relationships, perhaps in your finances. Choose today instead to trust God and stand firm. See, when we're in the middle of the battle, when the pressure's on, when the heat is turned up, it's completely easy to feel that God has forgotten us. 
that perhaps he's not watching on. But actually nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus is never closer than when we are facing opposition. He's with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He's with you right in the midst of your struggle. King Nebuchadnezzar looked into the fiery furnace. He didn't see three people. He saw four. Jesus is with us in our opposition. We don't know the outcome, but he promises to rescue us, to never leave us. And those who oppose you, they can never defeat you. They can never take away God's calling or God's plan for your life because Jesus has faced the ultimate opposition and he has the victory. He turned what looked like opposition into our opportunity that we might be forgiven, we might be saved, healed, set free. Jesus didn't compromise. Jesus didn't fight or flight. He stood firm, full of faith in what his father had called him to. Why did he do it? So that he might win life for us. Life in all of its fullness. You know, this isn't just hope for the future. This is hope for today. This is strength for today. Whatever it is that we're facing in our lives, whatever circumstances you're struggling with today, know that he is with you. He is for you. Be encouraged. Don't be deterred. Don't give up. Don't be tempted to throw the towel in. But know that Jesus chose to take opposition and turn it into an opportunity. He chose faith over fear. And we can do the same. In Jesus' name. Amen.